Why is your back? Because it's some very, very interesting talks. Um, the first one is by Mr. Roger Stringham of Photo, uh, photo Sonification Consulting. And his title is Conservation of Energy and Momentum, the Cavitation Heat Event. Yes, well, my name is Roger Stringham, and I'm, I'm the guy from Hawaii. <laughs> I, uh, I've been working in this field for ever since it started. And um, I guess within the first week, I had a cavitation device. And um, I tried it in D2O, and what I did is I burned up the uh, plate. It was really pretty exciting. So I knew I was making high temperatures, but that's the only thing I knew at that point. Uh, I, I, I didn't have a clue I was, you know, really doing this for 24 or 25 years. Um, so I, I have a collection of a lot of data and uh, some very interesting results in the early, uh, early part of the uh, cold fusion era. And, uh, Cavitation is something that I um, I know a little bit about, but um, I'm sure there are people here that uh, you know more than I do. But, uh, from my data that I picked up over the many years, I've sort of picked out some of the pieces that um, fit together. These are not really I cherry pick. I just pick the things that seem to fit a particular kind of a model. So this is the uh, this is the device. Up here is a disassembled capitation device and a little amplifier. And this is the device all assembled and put together, ready for use. Uh, it's a about a it's a 50 gram polycarbonate device with a, a piezo about the size of a, of a penny, not much bigger. No, it's actually smaller. Um, it's a 16 or 1.6 megahertz resonator. So uh, here is a, uh, another kind of a break, a breakup of a, uh, Another device that I used. I have so many devices that uh, it's hard to keep uh, things straight. I started out with a 20 kilohertz device. It was very uh, cumbersome. It uh, weighed about, uh, I would say, 10 kilos, and the uh, equipment that went with it weighed another 50 kilos. <laughs> it was big. This is the circulation of the D2O flow. It's actually going this direction. So we have a pump, and it's a, a mass displacement pump. And we have a, a filter, and we have a dark box. And I measure sun luminescence here with a photomultiplier. Now I have something called an MPPC device which is a multi-pixel uh, photon counter, and I get some very interesting uh, data from that. And I use that to let me know what is the condition of the plasma that is being circulated um, into the uh, target foil, which is within this re resonant uh, device. I measure the temperature in, the temperature out, after that, it's cold, a flow meter, argon over the D2O flow, back into the pump, and it just keeps on circulating at about 60, um, yeah, 60 uh, grams per, per minute. <clears throat> Now we're going to talk about sort of what what is cavitation at 1.6 megahertz or in the megahertz range. <clears throat> we have a, an acoustic cycle. 
and we have a, an acoustic, uh, acoustic input. We have sun luminescence that comes and it lasts for 100 nanoseconds, and that's it. And, and in this peak, there are the bubbles. And we go over here, and there's an, the next cycle. And we get, uh, we measure the photons at about 10 to the 10th photons per cycle. And we have a jet that comes off with the sun luminescence. There are the two big events, and these are uh, measurements. Uh, the bubble starts out quite small, grows up to a peak, collapses violently to a final um, radius of RF. This is a, um, an expansion of what we saw on the other page, the 100 nanoseconds. 10 to the 6 bubbles per cycle. Um, we measure the sun luminescence. It may have some Bernstrahling uh, radiation associated with it. That's what I'm working on right now. Um, this is the resonance device. This is the, uh, the MPPC. It's all in a black box. So we can measure the sun luminescence. We can measure it 16 centimeters, we measure it 8 centimeters, and um, everything seems to be quite reproducible. Here we have uh, represented what we see on the oscilloscope, the spikes of the sun luminescence and the acoustic wave. There's a one microsecond between each wave. And we have the final radius of the bubble, and it's collapsed and puts out a jet that is has deuterons in it, um, and uh, basically deuterons and electrons and injected into a target. Uh, it's a cloud of electrons with the deuterons right behind. It's basically a charge separation device. <coughs> so this is the, the MPPC data. Uh, we have the tool with the argon, 4.2 watts, and the blue is the uh, the mill, uh, it's the 16 millivolts about per peak, and the acoustic wave is about 100, 100 volts, and you can see how it's coupled. And what you can see here is the dead space in between these peaks, and that's what's uh, really amazing. This thing is only operating during this time period within the uh, bounds of, a, of these sharp peaks. And what I have down here is the target foil where the um, implantation takes place. This is a palladium foil. It's uh, 100 uh, nanometers thick. I don't mean nanometers, I mean microns. And uh, these little 50 nanometer ejectocytes that you see here, spotted. These are events that are um, basically made up of one, one alpha production. And uh, this, this is the concentration or distribution you would see in one acoustic cycle. And when you <clears throat> turn off the instrument or the device and pull out the foil, you see this particular interruption in one cycle, the distribution. What am I doing here? Oh. I got a slippery finger. Um, anyway, you have uh, these ejectocytes, 50 nanometers. They're all about the same, and they all have about the same energy. And when you
do a calculation of how much energy would it take to expel uh, uh, in a volume of, about, uh, of this size, it's in the range of uh, you know 20 20 uh, uh, microvolt uh, not microvolts uh, electron volts and um, there will be uh, a distribution that can be extrapolated <coughs> to have an output that was it would be equivalent to the measurements of the Calorimetry tree uh, uh, output system which I call Q0 I think I must have hit something with the... Uh, maybe I'll go back. Can I go backwards? No. Okay. <laughs> destroyed it. Oh, you have another one? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. Now, for some reason, uh, uh, we're starting to watch this one more. Um, I think we'll go to the next slide, and that's it. Okay. So we'll make sure that works for you, too, for some reason. <laughs> yeah. So this is a, a very imaginative approach to uh, what makes those little clusters that we see on that uh, palladium foil. What we have is a cluster that has been uh, produ produced by an implantation into a palladium foil, and we call that we call that M. And um, it can have 100 deuterons, or it can have um, 50, 10, 2, something like that. It can't go below two because uh, in this process you you make a um, you make an alpha at uh, some point, and that will be in the next slide. I use um, as a compression either electromagnetic forces or something called a um, um, it's called a um, image light charge. So it's, a, it's an image charge, and it consists of, of a, a numerical kind of approach, which I'm not going to go into. But if you go <clears throat> to this paper, this is 2009. It, it, this is Lawandi. Um, it's a very nice, uh, clean explanation of what an image charge is composed of. You have these uh, permittivities. In the electrons and deuterons, these uh, the deuterons are basically st <coughs> static compared to the very mobile electrons, and you get a E field additive here, and you get magnetic fields that are subtracted. So you're basically working inside of a magnetic surrounding a cavity. Um, The environment that you are producing uh, consists of some quantity that has a value of minus one, which uh, this is the ideal setup for for that. So you uh, have an interface that's surrounding this, and uh, it works very very well across the cluster in this interface, reducing the separation of these various deuterons. I would like to uh, show you the conservation of energy and momentum where um, A is equal to alpha. We have the kinetic energy and we have the energy of the alpha 
in the energy of M prime. M prime is happens at some time during this picosecond. This is basically a picosecond um, uh, timeline. In some place in this picosecond, you will have an event, and uh, it is it comes from this cluster that has a given number of deuterons, and this will have a deuteron have that number m minus two is in the this particular uh, m m prime. But anyway, we set up the equation, and uh, this is the uh, binding energy of uh, two do uh, two deuterons in an alpha. And that is the kinetic energy. And we have the momentum of the alpha minus the momentum of a cluster that is expanding. It's an expanding cluster. And we look at the center of mass. So we have two particles in this system. And um, this is a log plot here, log this way. And um, we look at uh, the number of of uh, deuterons that are here, and it, we take it down, and uh, this would be the alpha, it doesn't change in mass, and here we have the uh, expanding M cluster, and that's changing the mass all the way down, and um, uh, at a certain point, the mass, if the cluster is very small, you'll have, uh, the masses will be equal, to the alpha, that would be uh, this point. I, th I figured the, the masses are someplace in around here, um, which would be, uh, you know, like 18, maybe 30. But uh, what's interesting here is when you go down to this point here, and you're working with a fraction of a deuteron mass, um, it's really, um, uh, if you take a look at the different velocities that are produced here, we have the, the, v, uh, the VMs. Let's see, this is the, this is the M prime, and this is the, um, the, one, the alpha. It's not too clear, I have a hard time reading it. Anyway, <clears throat> these will all have um, a balance for the conservation of energy and momentum. And it's interesting that uh, the last point is a little bit over the speed of light. Um, and so uh, I think this is a little bit of a relativistic correction that all needs to be made here. But, but it also leads to the idea that uh, what you have here is something that is very close to uh, muon fusion. Um, but this is all um, pure numbers. There are no really experimental proofs here, except in this, from this particular distribution of ejectocytes. And uh, I just want to emphasize that it's here where um, the data has to be um, evaluated. We have some, when I count this, I have some 17 ejectocytes, and there are a few ejectocytes that are very faint, and those are ones that persist and last one, uh, one more time than uh, one, one cycle or two cycles instead of just the one. But they're usually um, not as common as, as, the, uh, as the other as the sites that last just for one cycle. So we want to look at uh, maybe how this might compare in different systems. So I, I, I'm looking at three different uh, systems. I'm looking at a basic, basically a calorimetry system, which uh, uh, when measured, gives me something on the order of um, the 
Q, the Q zero is actually the measurement, and that, say if that's at 50 wa uh, 58 watts, the Q zero comes from delta T times the mass flow rate in, in seconds times the conversion factor. Um, and the, and we have the acoustic energy is 15 watts, and we can subtract that from from the calorimetry measurement, and then that gives us Qx, a total of 43 watts after the subtraction. And that comes very close to, uh, if you do a calculation of, of 10 to the 7th um, uh, events that are basically the binding energy of the uh, two, two deuterons, and, uh, or the binding energy difference and uh, the, uh, uh, the alpha will be, uh, when you add that 10 to the sixth over the number of cycles, the megahertz cycles, you'll have 10 to the 13th uh, events and you, you multiply those two together and you get something like 38 qx watts, which is, you know, reasonably close and this, this is a number you can move any place you want to, just about, uh, uh, except uh, the 38 watts, and this, as you use these numbers, it's, it's exact. And this one is a little bit, um, uh, quite not so, no exact, but uh, it's pretty close. But the, <clears throat> the one that's kind of interesting is when you take the, uh, the little e events and you, you count them, you extrapolate out, you can also come up with 10 to the 13th uh, ejectocytes per second. And um, this is much, th this is the looser one. And you have something like uh, 60 QX watts. And this is an experimental value. <clears throat> so we have two experimental values and a calculated value. And they all sort of are in the same ballpark. Now, <clears throat> I should explain that when you have a 20 nanometer diameter ejectocyte, as you have right here, um, it's in the foil, it uh, deposits uh, its contents into the flow of the D2O. Uh, but, but there is also something called a footprint, a heating footprint. So you have that heat that forms kind of a hemispherical lattice heat, and uh, that it, 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 there is a lot of heat, and these, you know, the footprint comes out pretty far, pretty far, you know, and it doesn't cool down <coughs> until uh, <coughs> until it reaches well, when it reaches 1800 degrees centigrade, it has cooled down to the point where it no longer has any influence on the lattice, and uh, but it, it does have an influence, you know, within within this spherical distance on the target <coughs> and will erase uh, all of the uh, previous uh, uh, ejectocytes that were from the <coughs> earlier cycle. I think I'm losing my voice. And, uh, Roger. Yeah. It's probably good to finish up. So. Yeah, and I, I am finishing up. This is, sure. okay. this is basically, Thanks. we got a deep inch, this, and we have go back to this as our starting point. Thank you. Great. No, 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 no. Any questions? Yes, please. Two questions. Have you tried to measure the radiation except the, uh, other than the solar medicine? Have you ever tried that to measure the radiation? Radiation. Radiation. Did I measure any radiation? Uh, I didn't measure any gammas. Uh, the gammas, I think, are. I can pop here the mic. Excuse the mic. Yeah. I think the gammas <clears throat> are not coming out because they're within a condensate. And if it's in a condensate, uh, uh, my feeling is that. Uh, 
the heat will be uh, dispensed, or any radiation will be dispensed as heat. That's my opinion. The other one is, we use the argon gas. Argon gas. Argon gas. Oh, oh yes, oh. I use argon gas, yes. Uh, and then the reason for that? Yes. Uh, that will enhance the cavitation. Uh, it's a mono, uh, a mono gas that has a very high uh, polytropic constant. So when you um, use that, it, it excess leverage. And the, uh, How about to use the krypton or xenon gas? Pardon? How about to use the krypton or xenon? Krypton or xenon? Oh, oh, krypton or xenon. Well, yes. And you could actually use xenon. But uh, then that would uh, kill it. Yeah, one of those gases are very good and uh, much better than nitrogen or oxygen. Very good. Any mm -hmm. other questions? Well, again, thank you very much.